Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to Fudge Muppet. My name is Scott, and today it is time to share a brand new build experience for the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. With the release of Anniversary Edition, plenty of new content has been added, including artifacts from the lore that featured in previous entries, as well as more quest, home, and armor options. With all this in mind, we have tailored these new builds to utilize the best of this content, and today I present to you the Clockwork Apostle. A craftsman, an engineer, a pioneer who uses ancient Dwemer technology to make of himself an indestructible warrior with tools to attune the sound of his thumb and channel his dragonborn powers. The clockwork apostle ponders his purpose and place in the great chain of inescapable causality. His fascination with the grand designs of Mundus is unlimited. Each question answered births more questions in its place. He walks a path with no end, a journey of endless discovery. But it is that in itself which is the prize, for learning is its own reward. But before we dive into the Clockwork Apostle, I want to let you know that we've been fortunate enough to have a sponsor for this video, Raid Shadow Legends. This mobile RPG is all about building the right team of champions to overcome any challenge. Whether you're trying to push past a tricky campaign level or simply want to dominate in the arena or clan boss mode, using the right strategy is crucial. The biggest, baddest challenge of them all is the Doom Tower. This daunting tower of obsidian and magic was built long ago by a powerful servant of the Goddess of Light, the Arbiter. The tower itself was made to imprison dangerous creatures of eldritch might, but its wards have since grown weak. The regular Doom Tower floors aren't too difficult to overcome if you've built a strong team, but the bosses are really hard, so you'll probably have to experiment a fair bit to overcome them. Just to look at the Scarab King, it's hard to even put a dent in him unless you reduce his max HP, and he'll clean up your team fast if you attack without a shield buff on. In addition to the tough challenges, I also enjoy pouring through all the aesthetic champions on offer as well as looking through their skills and passive buffs to find new ways they could be mixed and matched together. This is the best time to get started in Raid, and if you click the link in the description or scan our QR code here on the screen, you'll get unique bonuses worth $30. There's a free epic champion, Virgis, 200,000 silver, one energy refill, one XP boost, and one ancient shard, so you can summon an awesome champion as soon as you get in the game. All this treasure will be waiting for you here. My name does not matter, nor when or where I was born, but I suppose you want me to satisfy your curiosity, and that I can respect. So I'll give you the bare minimum. I grew up in Galane, Hammerfell, under the name of Isbamir. My parentage is of no importance, and I would not consider the life I lived before to be remarkable in any way until I found it. An intellectual curiosity had always been essential to my being, but unfortunately it quickly outgrew my parents' capacity for satisfying answers, and so I looked elsewhere. I read books. At first, histories and the odd treatise on cultural developments or legal systems, but I quickly grew bored of the mundane and began study of the magical. My mind was an endless cup when it came to the sweet wines of metaphysical inquiry. I became obsessed with the truth, with the answers, the reality of what really happened. I wanted to understand the fundamental reasonings behind the creation of our world, and beyond if such a place existed. Naturally, magical education was what I sought next, but that could not have been an endeavor more fruitless. I am the unfortunate recipient of what you could call stunted magica, meaning that I do not have the magical talents that correspond with my willingness to learn. It was not a viable path, and so I continued my quest for knowledge. I searched for an alternate way. Yet a childhood of wonder was not forever, and before long I was roped into the role of my father's apprentice, sweating daily before a furnace, beating bars into blades for the soldiers who so choose to shed blood in the pursuit of glory. It was repetitive work, but it gave me time to ponder my questions, craft my theories. One day, mercenaries requested new weapons for a journey that they were about to undertake, a quest taking them deep into a Dwemer ruin on the behalf of a wizard. I pried, despite my father's chagrin, and the mouthy mercs gloated freely about how they were to find a Dwemer cube and take it from a vault with a special key built by the wizard that hired them. The day they arrived to collect their weapons and set off, I was ready to follow. Under oppressive sun and through sands and crags, I trailed them to their destination. I watched them fight ancient machines and cleave their way into the ruin. I followed quietly. I had never seen a Dwemer ruin so close, cylinders and gears, pistons and chambers, all pumping and steaming, cycling and screeching. These mercenaries were truly top shelf professionals, and they made short work of most, and soon they had made their way to a great vault door. I'd lost track of how long it had been, 
had no idea how deep we were, but I remained hidden. And for this, I am thankful because what happened next was unfortunate. A great Dwemer Colossus emerged from its station and began its annihilation of the mercenaries. Blasts of fire and belting metal echoed the chamber, followed by the squash of flesh and half-sundered screams. The leader lay charred before the vault door, the key undamaged and clasped in his crusted hands. I stayed to the shadows and witnessed the triumphant yet sacrificial victory of the Orc mercenary, who used the last of his waning strength to off-balance the Colossus and send them both tumbling off the ledge into a molten river below. It was quiet for a moment, and I let it stay that way. I watched as none of the mercenaries stood. I waited until a few groans quietened. And then, when I was sure of my safety, I made my move. I walked past the hacked limbs and machines strewn across the stone floor until I came to the leader and pried the vault key from his blackened hands, which crumbled to ashes as I did. This is where I found it. I went to the vault door, placed the key in its position, and the steam blew and gears turned and pistons pumped. Inside was a single pillar, sitting atop it was a single cube, and as I touched my hands to its starry surface, my mind was forever changed. Thousands of images rattled my brain, glimpses of things I could make no sense of, yet at the same time, I understood things, many things. I could look upon an automaton and intuitively understand the mechanisms behind its function. I could understand the engineering of this great chamber. Many things came to me. I was very dizzy all of a sudden, and it was what happened next that truly changed the fate of my life. A man with machine arms appeared from a magical portal and paralyzed me. I was taken. When I awoke, I was in court. The architecture was not unlike the Dwemer, but it had a different feel. Look, I'm not one for theatrics, so I'll do away with the suspense. I was before the Congress of Calibration in the Clockwork City. The highest-ranking apostles led by Galen the Shelterer were looking down upon me, deciding my fate. At the end of the Third Era, the Tribunal were killed, Sotha still among them, and his Clockwork City, an attempt at a perfection of Nern, was left in the care of his apostles, who attempted to preserve its majesty. Without the Clockwork God, the realm was without divine insight, and so the Clockwork Apostles had enlisted mercenaries to recover ancient Dwemer technology in the hopes that their insight would help them advance the city. Well, the mercenaries were under instruction not to touch the cube, but to handle it with gloves and place it in a special container they had. I was not privy to such information, and so when I touched the lexicon, I became the repository for a millennia worth of Dwarven knowledge. They could not figure out how to extract such knowledge without fear of its loss along with me, and so their hands were forced, and I became an unwitting pawn at first, relaying the information stored within my mind. However, in time, my curiosity and ingenuity earned me an official place among them. But more than either of those things, it was my philosophical agreement with Sotha Sill's grand ambitions that secured my place as a clockwork apostle. By the word... I wind the gears. I was limited in that my magical capabilities were non-existent, but I made up for this with determination, craftsmanship, and, well, a lexicon's worth of knowledge imprinted into my mind. But now I come to the part of the story that brings me great shame. An old enemy of clockwork was Mechanar, who had returned to enact his schemes upon the mechanical heart that powered the city, and I was part of a resistance against his emerging tyranny, and yet I was defeated and banished through a portal, only to awake amongst another battle. And so here I am, waking on a cart of prisoners, having been mistaken for an enemy combatant. Okay, so that is where the backstory brings our character up to in Helgen, and naturally he's going to escape and fight dragons, and eventually discover his place in the world as Dragonborn, and for this character, it is actually quite the important role. Firstly, there's going to be the whole aspect that he has stunted Magicka, and he could never excel in that field, and hence uses engineering and craftsmanship to work around it. So the idea that he is actually a virtuoso of the voice, a Dragonborn with great capacity, for the use of the thumb, 
Well, it may go to his head a little bit. But of course, then there is also the intellectual curiosity, learning this new language, uncovering his latent powers, using them to further the goals of the Clockwork Apostles, using his abilities to create a perfected Nern. Speaking of which, he was obviously cast into Skyrim by Mechanar's magic. But if you didn't know, the existence of Clockwork City in the Fourth Era is from the Elder Scrolls Legends card game, which outlines the story where Mechanar is the enemy and the forgotten hero either destroys the mechanical heart defeating him or manages to keep it going, still defeating Mechanar. Regardless, the Clockwork Apostle's destiny lies elsewhere, and at some point in your playthrough you can imagine a telepathic communication from Galen the Shelterer explaining their success at thwarting Mechanar, and you can tell him about your Dragonborn powers, and your new assignment is to learn all you can and master these skills. Of course, this role-playing is all in your head, but it helps clarify the character motives. So naturally, the main quest is going to be a big component of this character's arc, but there is a whole host of things to do with this character. As a progression of the main story, the Clockwork Apostle will travel to Solstheim and challenge Mirak, the first Dragonborn, and thwart plans of his return. Alongside this, he will study the depths of Hermaeus Mora's realm, that is Apocrypha, and retrieve the Black Books, absorbing their esoteric knowledge. Yet that is not all on Solstheim. The Anniversary Edition introduces a new storyline called the Ghost of the Tribunal, and this includes a cult of the Tribunal to Olmsavi that is operating in secret on the island, and the Apostle will follow this up and he will officially join the Olmsavi cult and help them fight their enemies and restore their collection of artifacts such as the Masks of the Tribunal, this is where you get the Mask of Sothasil, and also the weapons of Duoma craftsmanship like True Flame and Hope's Fire. This character could even use them, but I think Sunder fits better. Speaking of which, you'll want to complete the Legends Lost quest, started by reading the Lost Caravan Guard's note in New Nissus Corner Club, and this will lead you to the discovery of Sunder and Wraithguard, essential for this character. Keening you will also acquire through the College of Winterhold side quests involving Arnie Gain, which by the way, we will join the college by virtue of our Thum prowess. And as for the other factions, we don't really join any. The Companions, Thieves Guild, and Dark Brotherhood don't fit this character's pursuit for knowledge, and in the same way, the bickering of the Civil War doesn't really suit this character's motivations either. The Dawn Guard, however, are a good fit. After all, letting vampires spread their vile filth all over Skyrim is not a good way to go, and also, the enhanced Dwarven Crossbow and Dwarven Bolts of Shock can be acquired here with ease, but a fundamental part of this character is the Dwemer fascination, and there is a wealth of content to be found here in Skyrim. We will want to do the Unfathomable Depths quest, which will result in us getting the passive ability Ancient Knowledge, which gives you a 25% bonus to your armor rating when wearing Dwarven armor, and blacksmithing increases 15% faster. Perfect for our Dwemer Craftsman character. We'll also want to do the Lost of the Ages quest, which will send us on an adventure to collect shards of Ethereum, where we can forge ourselves the Ethereal Staff, which we can use to summon slash create Dwarven Automatons of our own. Quests of Dwemer Inquiry and Marvelous Machinery of the Ancients are going to be of great interest to the Clockwork Apostle. There are quests from Anniversary Edition like the Forgotten Seasons, which by the way in this new content you can get a Dwemer Horse Mount, which is very fitting, and you can also have a look at Nechuanthums, a Dwarven player home that can be acquired simply through rumors, giving you the quest, the sanctuary, and the manufactory. This provides a fitting home to place all of your artifacts and acquired pieces that aren't in use, as well as a vast book collection, which is another facet of this character. The Clockwork Apostle loves to read. He's a knowledge seeker. And if you tend to not really read the in-game books, then this may be the perfect opportunity to change that. When it comes to the Daedra, we have a mixed bag. The Clockwork Apostle finds them generally abhorrent, as Sotha Sil and his followers did, but he also understands that he can learn from them, or in other cases, acquire power from them, such as the case with Periite. The Apostle will help him out and acquire the Spellbreaker Shield. But on the other hand, when dealing with gods like Azura, the Apostle can easily betray this cruel anticipation of Set and continue the work of the Black Star, using it for his own ends. You will have to use your own discretion in regard to most Daedric Princes, but just bear in mind what this character values. Knowledge is paramount. Hence why Hermaeus Mora is worked with rather than against, but at the same time, gods like Molag Bell are going to be entirely unsavory for our protagonist. In general, any quests 
involving ancient knowledge, mystery, and learning are going to be of great appeal to the Clockwork Apostle, and he isn't the type to stick his nose in political affairs or quarrelsome disputes. He's a bit of a recluse in his dwarven home with his dwarven tools, his knowledge and craft, where he builds himself incredible armor and wields ancient artifacts with ease. He hones his thumb and learns all he can while slaying dragons and absorbing their souls. Perhaps through his eventual mastery, he'll be able to use the thumb or his understanding of it to create tools of tonal architecture. And perhaps these are the keys to restoring and excelling the Clockwork City and continuing the work of Sotha Sil in his pursuit of a perfected Nern. But that I think is all the role playing laid out before you. Time to get statistical. The Clockwork Apostle is a red guard as you can tell from the backstory. The Adrenaline Rush ability is quite handy when you have a build with high stamina usage because of the power attacks, the shield charges, and shield bashes. Additionally, some of the skill bonuses are handy for this character early on, but most of all, we chose Redguard because we wanted a Hammerfell native to investigate ancient Dwemer ruins that would have been less explored by the Clockwork Apostles, who were mostly native to Morrowind. So how about the stats? We want this character to feel like a weaponized, mechanized tank in a fantasy world. He's an engineer who has had to work around his lack of magical prowess and instead used his intellect to build impressive suits of armor. And to support this feel, we want lots of health. I suggest going 50-50 into health and stamina until stamina is at a value of 200 and then just pile the rest into health. With enchanting, we are going to get a bunch more stamina and with various enchantments from some unique gear, we're also going to have increased stamina regeneration on top of our adrenaline rush ability. As for the standing stone, you know it, I know it, it's the Atronarch stone. Things like the Lover stone can be used earlier on for leveling, but at the end of the day, the bonus 50% spell absorption is just too good and it helps the Clockwork Apostle fend off magical attacks. Now it's time to dig into the skills. They are archery, one-handed, block, heavy armor, smithing, and enchanting. The Clockwork Apostle employs his ingenuity and craftsmanship when designing a suit of indestructible dwarven metal fortified by enchantments and machinery so that he can channel his thorn with ease and last as long in a fight as the greatest warriors can. We want this character to have the vibe of Iron Man in a way. He's a genius, but at the end of the day, without his armor, he is just a human. In this endeavor, he will use knowledge of smithing and enchanting to design and create a suit of armor and weapons of godlike power, making him capable of surpassing any obstacle in his quest for enlightenment. There is nothing too complicated here, and I'll elaborate much more in the next section, but let's talk about some of the perks you'll need. The rest will be shown on screen. I'm only gonna talk about the highlights relevant to this build. For smithing, we are going to need steel smithing, dwarven smithing, and arcane blacksmith. Nice and simple, nothing too fancy. Arcane blacksmith is a essential to improve our host of artifacts and armor, and Dwarven is necessary for its creation and improvement. The Mask of Sotha Sil won't be able to be upgraded to legendary condition, but it doesn't really matter because by upgrading everything as much as possible with a blacksmith's elixir and the ancient knowledge perk, we will exceed the armor rating cap anyways. Enchanting, as always, is rather straightforward, but it is essential for this character's role playing, using soul gems to enchant his armor and weapons with great effects, replicating the feel of top-notch Dwemer engineering. Twin effects is going to be the game changer, giving us the ability to slot two enchantments, but more on that in the next section. Heavy armor is our bread and butter of defense, yet at the same time, we stick to the basics with Juggernaut 5 out of 5 for max armor rating and well fitted, as well as Tower of Strength for a little extra sturdiness, but the rest aren't necessary. One handed is our main attack form, and perks are basic damage centric ones and additional boost to our power attacks with perks like Savage Strike. We also get Dual Flurry and Dual Savagery for when we switch up tactics and dual wield. But block is where we spend a whopping 13 perk points. It's one of the best perk trees in my opinion, where you actually get solid benefit out of all the perk choices. The great perks here are things like block runner, giving us total freedom of movement with a shield raised, disarming bash, and the perks before it, giving us some deadly shield bashes with a bonus chance to disarm. And let us not forget shield charge, where we can take Spellbreaker and do a steam powered sprint into a crowd of enemies, bowling them aside before turning and crushing the fallen with Sunder. Archery is the final skill here, which is entirely chosen to give our tanks some far range combat options, and the Dwarven Crossbow is a perfect aesthetic fit. Power Shot, allowing us to stagger enemies 50% of the time on top of Quick Shot, speeding up our firing speed by 30%, gives us additional combat options, making us feel like a Dwarven Balliste and Dwarven Centurion rolled into one brilliant construction. 
But now's come the time to properly elaborate on the armor and weapons of the character, including all the enchantments and such. Let's start with the weapons. There are several tools of war in the Apostle's repertoire, all of them enchanted and powerful, some of them relics capable of tapping into universal powers. I am of course talking about the infamous tools of Kagrinak, used by the Tribunal to achieve divinity and used by the Nerevarine to sever it. Sunder is the hammer, and it's our primary weapon, with an enchantment that does 5 points of frost, fire, and shock damage, and it does 15 points of damage to stamina and magicka. However, when wielding it with Wraithguard equipped, it confers extra additional bonuses. Sunder, empowered by Wraithguard, makes it so that your stamina regenerates 50% faster, and you do 15% more melee damage in general. Quite the potent combination, and such applies to the other tool of Kagranak, Keening. It absorbs 10 points of magicka, 10 points of health, and 10 points of stamina, and with Wraithguard equipped, it confers a bonus 50 magicka, which really isn't relevant for us, as well as 20 stamina and 20 health. But there are other tools not of Kagranak's design in his arsenal. The Ethereal Staff allows us to summon a Dwarven Spider or Sphere for 60 seconds, which is befitting for this character, producing mechanical constructions upon the battlefield, but the Clockwork Apostle's elite engineering goes beyond that, and with it he designs the Dwarven Crossbow, with which he imbues a powerful Absorb Health enchantment, as well as a Minor Paralyze enchantment, which helps create openings in battle and make crowd control a lot easier. We pair this with Dwarven Bolts of Shock, which A, are more powerful, delivering 15 points of shock damage, and B, create a more techy, gadgety feel for this character. Bear in mind that you two might want to create a simple Dwarven Axe or Dagger with a weak Soul Trap enchantment for the purposes of filling Soul Gems and charging your gear. But what about the armor? Following on from weapons, it's probably natural that we first mention the shield, and of course, it is the iconic Spellbreaker, the Dwemer Shield, artifact of Periite that when blocking creates a ward that protects against spells for up to 50 points. This combined with spell absorption and the resistances we have will become quite the machine that your pitiless enemies will try to rage against. As I mentioned before, the gauntlets we have equipped is the vital component of Kagranak's tools, and that is Wraithguard, which confers a 10% resistance to shock, fire, frost, magic, disease, and poison. And it also empowers Sunder and Keening. We will be wearing Dwarven Plate Armor, enchanted to boost our health and stamina, and Dwarven Plate Boots, which are designed to boost our one-handed damage and stamina again. The Apostle's Ring and Necklace will both be enchanted with one-handed damage boosts as well as magic resistance. And finally, the Mask of Sothasil is worn as a sacred piece, so that the Apostle may embody the Clockwork God and his mission for a perfected Nern. We enchant it with bow damage boosts and water breathing, because why not? All of this build information is going to ultimately culminate in a playstyle, some of which you've seen in action, but it's worthwhile expanding on here. Now, with a lack of traditional magic, the Apostle relies on his gear and engineering, but also his thumb. Dragon Shouts are used liberally, and some of our favorite picks are things like Cyclone, Disarm, Dragon Aspect, Fire Breath, Ice Storm, Storm Call, and Unrelenting Force. Even the odd Whirlwind Sprint, if needed to close distance between you and an enemy. We want his thumb to feel as if it's focused by his special armor, which we can roleplay is constructed in part similarly to how tonal architecture was done by the Dwemer, with the attenuators inbuilt into the armor and mask. And with this, the Apostle can channel his voice to a greater degree. So shouts are the main attraction, but how about using the gear? The most basic and reliable approach for this character is Spellbreaker in one hand, Sunder in the other, charge in with a shield raised, bowl your enemies down and start swinging that hammer bashing them down again with your shield if they try and get up. However, the Apostle is versatile and is suitably specialized in dual wielding if you feel like you need a bit of berserker action. With Sunder and Keening equipped, you'll be able to attack incredibly fast and also get some valuable health and stamina back via Keening's enchantment. This dual wielding option can be great to switch in and out of, especially for bosses or tougher enemies. Switch back to Spellbreaker if you need to bunker down and ward some damage. And we also have a more ranged option suitable for dragons and those faraway enemies using ranged themselves, or also suitable for a retreat option. Firstly, the ethereal staff can be used to summon dwarven automatons that provide valuable support and distraction, and then with a dwarven crossbow, especially with the stagger perk and the paralyze enchantment, the crowd can be more than controlled, and the absorb health enchantment is really going to provide us with some serious recovery. So in summary, ranged first, shield charge in and smash skulls with a hammer, and if you need more and faster damage, switch to Keening and Sunder and go wild with
with dual power attacks and use shouts to your advantage, especially crowd control oriented ones such as Ice Form, Unrelenting Force and Cyclone. But that ladies and gentlemen, I think is everything you need to know how to play the Clockwork Apostle build. I hope you've enjoyed the video and I hope you enjoy playing this new vanilla Skyrim build, utilizing the new content that comes with the Anniversary Edition. Do consider supporting us on Patreon, subscribe for more Elder Scrolls builds, lore and our weekly Elder Scrolls podcast. Thanks so much for all your support and do be sure to like the video if you enjoyed it because it really helps out the channel. Thanks again. My name's Scott from Fudge Muppet and I'll be back to nerd out with you again next time.